the Great Pyramid of Giza, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon, the Statue of Zeus at Olympia, the Temple of Artemis at Ephesus, the Mausoleum at Halicarnassus, the Colossus of Rhodes, and the Lighthouse of Alexandria. We call them the Seven Wonders of the Ancient World, a very selective list describing engineering feats and architectural masterpieces that need to be seen to be believed. But who actually came up with this list? And why is it only possible to visit just one of them today? Did the rest of the wonders even exist? In order to get to the truth behind this iconic list, we need to investigate where it came from, who made it, and why it's become so iconic. Then, because it's a Dig It With Raven video, we're going to take a deep dive into each one and go beyond the glamour and the mystique. We're going to be looking at the people who had the vision to create monuments that brought the whole world to their knees. We'll be reading the ancient sources who wrote about them thousands of years ago and looking at the archaeological evidence from excavations at the sites where they once stood in order to bring them back to life. The Seven Wonders of the Ancient World might not have been these fantasy-like places that people during the Renaissance liked to believe, but they could have been real places that created the ultimate ancient Mediterranean bucket list. Let's start with a simple question. Why? Why were these legendary monuments built? And why, thousands of years ago, did people decide to list out the best of the best in their known world? Well, a simple question deserves a simple answer. It is a very human thing to compete with nature. We see it everywhere today, and it is something that we've been doing for a really long time. The natural world has already created sites that humanity marvels at waterfalls, mountains, rock formations that defy gravity, and humans, for whatever reason, want to join in on the fun and build something that can elevate themselves to or even go beyond nature. Architects, masons, and sculptors are driven to express themselves in ways that have never been done before and create something that will immortalize both them and their civilization. We can see this today in people's missions to build the world's tallest skyscraper or entirely self-sufficient walled cities in the desert. Huge building projects don't normally start with the aim to be boring and functional. People want an emotional response to a piece of art, that wow factor, that wonder. Ah, ah, now you get it. The seven wonders of the ancient world weren't immediately classified as wonders right off the bat, nor were the seven we know of today the seven that made everyone's list. Instead, they were listed as sites to be seen by ancient Greek writers under the Greek word theamata, which translates to things to be seen. Yep, the list of the seven wonders started off as a travel blog. The top things to see in the ancient Mediterranean. I mean, I have to laugh a bit at this. Here we are marveling at these monuments that don't even exist anymore and holding this list up to the highest regard when we look at the ancient world. And all it really was, was a bunch of ancient Greek people writing lonely planet guides. <laughs> it also makes sense now that the list of wonders varied somewhat from person to person in their writings, just like different travel blog sites do today. But in all seriousness, it does make sense as we use travel guides all the time, so why wouldn't ancient people do the same? So how did these bucket list tourist sites become wonders as we know them today? Well, as people started to visit and quote, wonder at their impressiveness, it became common to refer to them as such. And it was really not that difficult for the ancient Greeks because the word for wonder is Thaumata. Not the hardest change of titles from Theamata, is it? Over the next centuries, people traveled around the ancient Mediterranean to see these sites and others that were built during their lifetimes. The list evolved and varied from person to person, and it wasn't until the Renaissance that this list as we know it today was finalized as the ultimate top seven of the ancient world. You might think that the current list of the seven wonders of the ancient world was created by some holier-than-thou governing body or committee traveling around every year and judging the best new architectural feats of the day and updating that list accordingly. And when you look at them all on a map, it may seem a little biased as they're concentrated around one general area. And this is because of where the writings of these wonders lists were coming from. That brings me to my next question. Who wrote these lists? Who was the major influencer who started the trend of listing off the best places in the world? For that answer, we have to go all the way back to the OG travel influencer, Herodotus. 
He was probably the one who laid the foundations for the Ancient Wonders list in his big book, Histories, written in the mid-5th century BCE. Herodotus was born in 484 BCE at Halicarnassus, which is modern-day Bodrum in Turkey, and one of his favorite things was to marvel at the achievements of the Greek and other Eastern civilizations. Herodotus is also known as the father of lies, so no one's sure how much of his work we can take super seriously, but he was definitely the first guy in ancient Greece to write down his marvelings of the ancient Mediterranean. And boy, did he love to marvel. When he was alive, only two of the ancient wonders on the current list would have existed, the Great Pyramid of Giza and the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. So if he did have his own Mediterranean bucket list, we have no idea what else could have been on it. Ooh, mystery. What have we not found yet? Like, ah, the suspense. Size mattered with Homer, and he loved writing about the big things like the pyramids and the massive city walls of Babylon. And it seems like he started a trend because each of the seven wonders of the ancient world all have this in common. Their size was so large that it gave everyone a sense of awe and wonder. Making a list of places to visit became a lot more possible and popular after Alexander the Great showed up on the scene. When ATG, as I like to call him, famously crossed the Hellespont in 334 BCE to free Greek cities that were under Persian control, and then, well, you know, he conquered all of Persia, and the Greek world became linked with the East, and a lot of things really opened up. People were able to travel freely around the entire area and share ideas ideas and cultures. You might have heard of the spread of Hellenism, which was the spread of Greek culture and language throughout the Near East and Asia. We make it sound so romantic today, but it's just another example of ancient colonization something that has happened a lot throughout history. Even in the centuries after the death of Alexander, the world became a lot more open for wealthy travelers, and this is when we see so many ancient wonder bucket lists starting to appear. The first evidence we have for a wonders list is from Callimachus of Cyrene, who lived from 305 to 240 BCE. He worked in the library of Alexandria, I mean, what a flex, and he wrote a book called A Collection of Wonders in Lands Throughout the World. The final monuments that would make the wonders list, the Colossus of Rhodes and the Lighthouse of Alexandria, would have been created during his lifetime, with the Colossus of Rhodes finishing construction in 292 BCE and the Lighthouse beginning construction in 280 BCE. So it is actually possible that all of the seven we know of today would have been included. No copies have survived and we have no details about it whatsoever, but we can safely assume that the publication of this would have inspired others to choose their own wonders and write about them. And they did. The first list of seven wonder-worthy monuments that we have is from a poet called Antipater of Sidon, who was alive just over a hundred years after Callimachus's death. He lists the walls and the hanging gardens of Babylon, the statue of Zeus, the Colossus of Rhodes, the pyramids of Egypt, the mausoleum at Halicarnassus, and the temple of Artemis. It's not quite the same list that we have today as he swapped the lighthouse of Alexandria for the walls of Babylon, but it's close. That means we have written evidence of the idea of the seven wonders of the ancient world in the second century BCE. That's wild. We have other lists from different people, like Philo of Byzantium, as well as other monuments that were included on other lists, like the Ishtar Gate in Babylon that was built by Nebuchadnezzar in 575 BCE. As we travel further in time into the Roman period, we have writers like the poet Martial, who added the Flavian Amphitheater, better known as the Colosseum in Rome, to his list in the first century AD in his book Liber Spectacularum. And I hope that book was spectacular. Bishop Gregory of Tours, who was born in the 6th century CE, added the Temple of Solomon in Jerusalem, and he added Noah's Ark. So you can kind of see how people's lived experience and their values are reflected in how they created their lists. The pyramids were actually still included in early Christian lists because they were thought to be the granaries that were built by Joseph to store excess grain. So they're the like long-lasting 
OGs on, these, on this list. They made it through pretty much every iteration. Then in the next century CE, the Venerable Bede, like, man, what a name, wrote a list of his seven wonders that was the first one to include the Lighthouse of Alexandria. The official list as we know it today became as famous and well known as it is thanks to the Renaissance. Dutch painter and engraver Martin van Heemskerk was one of the first artists to depict the seven wonders of the ancient world along with the Colosseum as his suggested eighth wonder. And these were engraved and published by Philip Galle in 1572. Now I'm thinking that that's actually a Dutch name and be like Philip Gaal. It might be that one. This seems to be the first time the official list of seven was put together, including the Lighthouse of Alexandria. And these engravings are very fantastical and over the top. Also not the most accurate if you look at the pyramid engraving. He clearly never visited Egypt, but like many people in the Renaissance, he would have been an avid reader of ancient writing. These works went on to inspire a lot of other artists and help solidify the list of seven as we know them today. Armed with all all of that lovely background knowledge and history, let's dive right into our first wonder of the ancient world. We're going in chronological order, so first on up is the Great Pyramid of Giza. I've already done three, count them, three videos on the pyramids, one about who built them, one on how they were built, and one on even debunking a bunch of ancient aliens claims about them. I've done a lot of pyramid content, folks. You could call the collection a whole scheme, get it? Get it? So to make sure I don't repeat myself, I'm going to spit some facts that I haven't mentioned yet, as well as go over the history of the Great Pyramid, and then we're going to delve into the actual anatomy of the pyramid, which I don't think we've talked about much yet. We're going on a little tour, my friends. Ooh, how exciting. It's like we're completing the ancient Greek bucket list together. Aw, little adventure for me and my friends. Mm. Since the inception of the list of the seven wonders, the pyramids have always held a spot. Though so it is the Great Pyramid built by the Pharaoh Khufu that gets the most focus and attention. It's the biggest pyramid, and since this list is all about big wondrous things, it makes sense. The Great Pyramid is also the only ancient wonder that still stands in an almost complete and recognizable form today. And it's the oldest one to boot, built around 2500 BCE. Talk about your expert craftsmanship here. The pyramid was the epitome of kingship in ancient Egypt. Khufu's monument was the result of a long line of development of pyramid building in Egypt. The whole thing really peaked with his pyramid and the other two at Giza. The practice later deteriorated and pyramid building was eventually abandoned altogether and replaced by being buried under a natural pyramid known as the Lady of the Peak which we know as the Valley of the Kings. Making this video, I learned that this natural rock formation was sacred to the goddess Merit Sigur, which translates to she who loves silence. I love that. The pyramid shape itself is also greatly tied to the worship of the sun god Ra at Heliopolis. At least the major capstone called a Benben stone or pyramidion at the top anyways. In one of the creation myths from ancient Egypt, a mound arose from the primordial waters called the Benben, and this is where the creator god Atum settled. This is also related to the Egyptian obelisk as we have that similar capstone at the top there. A lot of ancient cities in ancient Egypt had a similar creation story with that of this primeval mound. The original Ben Ben stone was named after this mound and was a sacred stone in the temple of Ra at Heliopolis, as it was said that that was where the first rays of the sun fell onto the earth. And it's thought that this was the prototype for our pyramid and obelisk capstones. The Ben Ben stone was a home to a bird deity called Bennu, who was also worshipped at Heliopolis and was linked with the sun, creation, and rebirth. This bird was probably the inspiration for the phoenix. I think that's pretty cool. I love a good phoenix. I don't know about you guys. When I say the Great Pyramid is huge, I mean it was huge, okay? It covers a span of 13 acres, is 230 meters long, long and 146 meters high, and it consists of 2.3 million stone blocks, each weighing over two tons on average. That's a lot. 
part of the religious requirements in the Old Kingdom when the Great Pyramid was built was that the entrance is located north facing the polar stars. The original entrance is actually just above and to the left of the modern entrance that tourists use today, which was made in the 9th century CE. This hole that we go through is known as Al-Mamun's hole because it was made by the Caliph Al-Mamun, who was the son of the very famous Harun al-Rashid. Al-Mamun made this hole while he was searching for the entrance of the pyramid to find a treasure that was supposedly inside. According to Arab accounts, a great golden cockerel and an emerald the size of a rock's egg was hidden inside the Great Pyramid. A rock is this legendary enormous bird of prey that is popular in Middle Eastern mythology. So I'm imagining an emerald like like this size or something, which I mean, yeah, that's a pretty blast through a pyramid worthy if if you're into that stuff. This big bird, big bird is about that size, I guess. Yeah. Oh. Archaeological and historical research believe that this tunnel wasn't completely made by Al Mamun, as there is a report by Dionysus E. Tel Mahario, who claimed that before Al Mamun's expedition, a 33 meter long hole had already been made in the north face of the pyramid that was later resealed during a possible later restoration in the New Kingdom. This suggests that a robber's tunnel already existed and the Caliph cleared away the debris and just enlarged it further. Once you enter through Al Mamun's hole and go up the ascending passageway, we have the entrance to the Grand Gallery. There's also a descending passageway that goes right through the bedrock and leads to a subterranean chamber, but you can't normally go down there as a regular visitor. Though it does seem that it was accessible during classical antiquity as either a Greek or Roman character was found on the ceiling of this chamber. The western half of the room is unfinished and German archaeologist Ludwig Burkhardt suggested that this chamber was originally planned to be the burial place for Khufu, but was later abandoned for a higher chamber at the top of the Grand Gallery. Coming back up to the Grand Gallery, if you follow the passageway at the bottom of the gallery, you get to the Queen's Chamber. This room got its name from Arab explorers hundreds of years ago, but research into it shows that it wasn't meant to be a burial chamber for a queen. The chamber is made of limestone and has a gabled ceiling. There aren't any inscriptions on the walls, but there is a corbelled niche in the east wall that's about four and a half meters tall. Two shafts were discovered on the north and south walls of the chamber going up through the pyramid, but not completely reaching the outside. No one really knows their purpose, but inside one shaft, Wayman Dixon discovered a stone sphere, a wooden slab, and a copper object in the shape of a swallow's tail that is referred to as a hook in 1872. These objects were lost until the ball and the hook were rediscovered in the collection storage at the British Museum, and the piece of wood was recently found Found at the University of Aberdeen. Can you imagine what else might be in those collections? Like, gosh. Since the 90s, researchers have been sending cameras and robots up these shafts, and they discovered that they are blocked by some sort of limestone door with two copper handles of sorts. A small hole was drilled into the southern door, and on the latest expedition, they were able to see inside a small chamber that was behind it, which had hieroglyphics written in red paint. They were also able to look at the backside of this limestone door and saw that the stone was polished, suggesting that it had a specific reason and it wasn't just to block the shaft off from debris. And the copper handles were also determined to be just decorative. Gosh, the attention to detail in this place is wild. Also, oh my gosh, we know so much about the Great Pyramid and yet so many things still elude us. Oh, I love it. Now, finally, you've heard the term enough times in this video, let's talk about the Grand Gallery. This large space inside the Great Pyramid continues on the same slope as the ascending passage and leads to the King's Chamber. This thing is absolutely show-stopping. I got to see it without anyone else in it because I was visiting during a very quiet time and I stupidly never took any pictures, but oh my God, it was one of the most amazing things that I've ever seen in my life. The gallery is made out of seven layers of massive stone blocks that are corbelled inwards, so at the top, it's only one meter wide. The Grand Gallery also consists of a shelf or step on either side, and in these shelves are 56 slots, 
28 on each side with 25 niches cut above the slots into each wall of the gallery. The purpose of these slots isn't known, but the central gutter that's in the floor of the Grand Gallery is the same width as the ascending passage. This has led to people speculating that the stones used for blocking the passage off and sealing the burial chamber were stored here and then the slots held wooden beams to hold them in place above the floor to allow the funeral to take place. After the priests left, the workmen stayed behind to knock down the wooden beams to let these huge granite slabs slide into place and block the entrance. Don't you worry about the workmen though. They had an escape route. They got out via a narrow shaft that led from underneath a stone in the upper corridor at the top of the gallery, down through the pyramid into the lower corridor. At the top of the grand gallery, we get to the antechamber, the last line of defense against a robbery. Man, this thing was a fortress. It was designed to house more blocking stones to protect the entrance to the burial chamber. But alas, even the best laid plans can fail and it didn't prevent any robberies. More on that later though. Through the antechamber, we finally get to the piece de resistance, the king's chamber. This chamber is made entirely of granite and is where Pharaoh Khufu would have been laid to rest. There aren't inscriptions inside this chamber and the only object inside is a sarcophagus which was hollowed out of out of one giant piece of granite. When it was rediscovered in the early Middle Ages, it was already broken open and all of the contents inside were missing. What's wild to me is that the sarcophagus is too big to fit around the corner between the ascending and descending passages, so it must have been put into place in this chamber before the roof was put on. Which is like... Very smart planning. The king's chamber also has two narrow shafts in the north and south walls, similar to those in the queen's chamber. We aren't sure if these ones originally penetrated the outer casing of the pyramid, and we also don't know what their purpose was. For a while, Egyptologists thought they could be ventilation shafts, but then, of course, in true archaeological style, with all things that we don't understand the purpose of, we decided it was probably for a ritualistic purpose. Aren't we just predictable little bugs? Eh? Above the king's chamber are five relieving chambers that were probably for relieving the pressure of all that pyramid stone on top of the ceiling and preventing it from caving in on itself. Hence the name relieving chambers. I'm gonna stop saying relieving now. All of them are flat except for the top one that has a cute little pointed roof. Again, this is more for weight distribution and strength. They've found a bunch of graffiti made in red ochre paint that was made by the workmen in these areas. You can see the leveling lines and the names of the work gangs who were building this pyramid. Graffiti is such an ancient thing and I am obsessed with it. I love that we've always wanted to leave our mark on things. It's just, it's so nice. Now I know everyone in the comments would be popping off if I didn't mention the two mystery spaces that were recently found inside the pyramid, so here we go. In 2017, scientists from the Scan Pyramids Project discovered a large void above the Grand Gallery using muon radiography, and they called it the Big Void. It is very fitting. It's at least 30 meters long, and its cross-section is similar to that of the Grand Gallery. We don't know what the Big Void was for, and it's not accessible, so we can't get to it right now. It was suggested that it could have been used for the construction of the Grand Gallery, but the research team has said that it's it's completely different from the construction spaces that have been previously identified in this pyramid. So that means, oh yes, another mystery that all the ancient aliens fans are coming out of the woodwork for. And I need to say it, I'm gonna say it again, it wasn't alien. It, it just wasn't. And, and, and this news came out literally like a week and a half ago at the time that I'm filming this. Uh, so not when it's coming out, but a new nine meter long chamber was discovered above the main entrance to the pyramid. This is so much cooler than the big void in my opinion, because we have photographic confirmed proof of what's there. That's all that's been said really up until now and a lot more research needs to be done, but boy, it just goes to show you that you may think you know something even after hundreds of years of research, thousands if you count the writings of Herodotus and other ancient scholars, but nope, there can always be a surprise. 
And I love that. I love that about archaeology. The Great Pyramid of Giza was the tallest building in the world for over 3,000 years until Old St. Paul's Cathedral was constructed in the 1200s CE. It was already 2,000 years old when Herodotus was said to have visited, and by that time he said it had already been robbed. And it was probably around 2300 BCE or in the Middle Kingdom. But then that entrance was eventually covered with rubble, which is why Caliph al Mamun had to make his new one. Raven, tell me more about this ancient entrance. Okay, okay, I will. Strabo, who lived around 64 BCE to 21 CE, wrote about the pyramid, which he mentioned as one of the seven wonders of the world. And he said that high up, approximately midway between the sides, it has a movable stone. And when this is raised up, there is a sloping passage to the vault. Say what now, Strabo? A flap door to enter the pyramid? Oh my God, that is so wild. So that means maybe the original entrance through the original limestone casing was disguised to blend in with the rest of the pyramid and it just was like a little flap door. Oh my god, I love it. At the time the ancient writers were visiting the pyramid, it would have had most of this limestone casing intact. This wouldn't have been mostly removed until an earthquake in the 1300s, which loosened a lot of the casing stones, and they were later removed in the same century by the Sultan to build mosques and forts in medieval Cairo. More casing stones were removed in the 1800s by Muhammad Ali Pasha to build the Alabaster Mosque in Cairo as well. There is still some left intact on the pyramid and one block on display at the British Museum. Of course, it's there. Where else would it be? I could go even further into the entire pyramid complex, the Queen's Pyramids, the boat pits, and the workers' village that was found nearby, but then this video would be like an hour long and we still have six wonders left to explore. Needless to say, the Great Pyramid of Giza has and always will continue to invoke wonder into everyone who as much as sees a photo of them hopefully for another 4,000 years. Given its track record and its resilience throughout time, it's very likely that it'll still be here long after the human race is gone. As the Arab proverb says, man fears time, yet time fears the pyramids. Thanks so much for watching you guys. If you enjoyed the video, you know what to do. Smash the like, smash the subscribe, all that fun stuff. And if you like the channel, you wanna help support it even more, head on over to Patreon to become a patron. You get early access to all of my videos. You get some really cool stuff on there and it really helps in me providing you a lot more value in these videos. The link's in my bio if you wanna head on over there and become one of the amazing people on the screen right here. And you know, I really appreciate it. Make sure you're subscribed so you don't miss the other seven wonders of the ancient world and maybe one or two surprise episodes in between. Stay dirty, my friends.